So he joined, he joined Reading University um, in 2012, which was just after I left. And uh, prior to that, he was in Toronto, conveniently not there when I visited. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to finally meet you at last, Ted. Um, Ted has worked on some of the really big questions in climate dynamics and climate modeling. And he's worked at all the top places. He's been at Cambridge, at MIT, and he's now at the University of Reading. And he's going to talk to us today about some of his more recent work. Over to you, Ted. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and uh, I'll go right into it. I hope this isn't too simple for some of you, but we'll, um, um, I've been, I, I, I think the more I, the older I get, the more I think we need simpler ways of thinking. And I'll just point out that this work actually came, uh, I acknowledge the fact that I had to teach uh, statistics finally um, after all, all this time. And as you know, the, the way to learn is to teach and also uh, unfunded research. So there's maybe a lesson there. Um, sorry, click here. So I'll just jump to, to, to the heart of the matter and then we'll come back to this and, and unpack this. Climate change science, I think we would all agree is anchored in physical understanding. If you read the uh, IPCC, that's absolutely clear. But we can't do co controlled experiments on the real climate system, and we have very little data measuring what we are actually trying to predict. So that, so that, the, that, that's a challenge. And yet the treatment of uncertainty in published climate change science is dominated by the far-reaching influence of what might be called the frequentist tradition in statistics. And in this tradition, uncertainty is interpreted in terms of sampling statistics as an emphasis on p-values and statistical significance. But for climate change science, a sampling di a distribution is not always meaningful. There's only one planet Earth. And there's no room in this, in this tradition for expressing the uncertainty of a scientific hypothesis, which is crucial to uh, physical understanding. And there's no room for the concept of ca causality, which again, cause-effect relationships is central to physical understanding. So all of this creates a disconnect between physical reasoning and statistical practice in climate change science. Um, and I've, I've written a paper in climatic change. It's, a, it's, it's an essay really, it came out of an interdisciplinary workshop on philosophy of science and climate change, part, part of a special issue there. And you can get it from my website, it's open access, you can find it easily. Now, if you don't believe me, uh, I start with this paper. Um, Mark Zelenka and colleagues published a very important paper a year and a half ago. It's I think all, or two years, I guess now, um, early 2020. I think it's already been cited 350 times or something like that. And you, you, you may have heard that the CMIP-6 models have a higher climate sensitivity than the CMIP-5 models, and they show that it's due to, um, mainly due to stronger positive cloud feedbacks from decreasing extratropical low cloud coverage and albedo. As I say, it's a very important paper. It's a really thorough analysis, very comprehensively done. And these, importantly, they say these changes in the representation of cloud processes are believed to be realistic. So even though the climate sensitivity is higher than is commonly believed uh, is sh should be the case. These changes at least are, are, are the right kind of changes. But then they have a statement in the abstract saying the higher climate sensitivity is not statistically sig significant. Now I found that very strange. I, I emailed Mark as I was sure it had to be something that a referee insisted on, on a, a, a inserting. And he said, no, no, they, the authors chose, chose to say that. So what on earth did, did, does this mean? Normally when you say that, it means that you should ignore the result. Um, so if you unpack that, a, a significance test has to assume hypothetical populations of CMIP-5 model type models and of CMIP-6 type models. What do we mean by that? Um, and when you count everything, the concept of statistical sig sig significance is irrelevant. We don't talk about statistical sig significance uh, uh, of election outcomes. We just count the votes. You, users need to know that the climate sensitivity a, 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 a in the CMF6 models is higher. Otherwise, they might wonder why the uh, likelihood of heat waves uh, ha has increased or something like that. And I think what's happening is that a p-value is effectively be used as a descriptive statistic, not an inferential statistic. So why not just report it that way? Uh, the 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 magnitude of the difference relative to the to the uh, uh, ensemble spread. And also the significance test has to assume that with any hypothetical population, there is a true CMIP N type climate sensitivity and that the deviations result from it result only from chance. So basically you're saying that climate model improvements are shared instantaneously around the world, which they probably are to some extent, but that any particular skill of any particular modeling center is just 
just, just by chance. Now, you know, I was on on the on the on the um, review committee for 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 the Hadley Center for a number of years. I think they would be quite uh, offended just to think that this was just you know a, a monkeys and typewriters exercise. Now, to step back. Um, a consideration of all the uncertainties and climate change in the, in the traditional way leads to what's been dubbed a cascade uh, of uncertainty. This is the will be and decide version of that. You, for, you start with f f future society, then you have the greenhouse gas emissions, climate models, the regional scenarios and impacts and so on. And we need to navigate this whole, this whole cascade uh, 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 of uncertainty. Now, there, of course, there's, uh, there are methods for decision making under uh, uncertainty. It's not something that I work on specifically, but I do know about it a bit. Uh, there's this essay by Andy Sterling uh, a decade ago in, in Nature where he creates this uncertainty the matrix. I think there's different versions of this kind of thing where his axes are uh, whether the possibilities are problematic or unproblematic and, or whether the probabilities are unproblematic or problematic. And uh, in the upper right, sorry, upper left corner, which is when everything is unproblematic, you have the classical uh, risk. This is what's called known as Knightian risk. Uh, to go back to Fra Frank Knight, the, the economist, quantifiable risk. And then you have lots of methods of doing that, of course, cost benefit analysis, et cetera. Um, and then, but then as you, as either the possibilities or the probabilities become problematical, you then get to into more ambiguous or uncertain situations. So Knight characterized the rest of it as just uh, uh, uncertainty. Um, and uh, Sterling makes the point that political pressures tend to push attention from the, what he calls the plural conditional um, methods, which are the, uh, the darker shading towards the lower right part here, towards the upper left, which is the, um, the single definitive. And we are, issue, we are pressured to issue single definitive statements. If you want to publish in nature, your, headline, your title has to be a single definitive statement, no ambiguity allowed. And it, of course, IPCC is producing um, uh, single definitive statements there in, uh, and if you're in a, in a consensus mode, what you'll wind up with inevitably will be reliable, but rather uninformative statements. For example, in Britain, we're quite interested in, in the North Atlantic storm tracks and the, sta and the statement from the summary for policymakers in the, in the last report just came out. There's low confidence in projected changes. That's true, not very helpful. So we need a language for expressing a plural conditional state of knowledge. Um, that would include multiple mutually exclusive hypotheses and a lecture, logic for structured scientific reasoning. And frequentist statistics, which we just use uh, standardly in climate science, has no such language or any logic behind it. So there have long been calls to get rid of statistical significance, which is one of the um, main features of this. Uh, this is a Nature editorial from uh, a few years, three, three years back now almost. Um, it is the, there was a, a, a commentary signed by a, a hundreds of statisticians to make the point that it would make science harder, but it would make it better. Now, an obvious point is that null hypothesis significance testing and the p-value less than 0.05 should not be interpreted as true-false or di di dichotomously. This has been pointed out, of course, many, many times. But I think for climate science, the issue runs much deeper that, that, than this too. And so I, you can read lots and lots of papers on all hypothesis significance testing and, and, its, and its problems, um, but I'll try to dig into the physical aspects more. Now, it, I, there's a, 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 a paper I like by Gigerenzer, who's a, a psychologist who's written, he's also written a lot of popular books, but he's a very good statistician. And he wrote this paper uh, in 2004, Mindless Statistics, he called it. He says, uh, statistical rituals largely eliminate statistical thinking in the social sciences, but I don't think it's any different in climate science for the most part. I'll, I'll make some exceptions at, at the end there, um, but for the most part. And uh, what, what he calls the null, null ritual consists of three steps, set up a statistical null hypothesis, but don't specify your own hypothesis or any alternative. Use the 5% significance level for, for, for rejecting the null and accept your hypothesis and always do this. Now, Gigerenzer explains that null hypothesis significance testing is a bastardization of two ideas from frequentist statistics, uh, Fisher's null hypothesis testing. And in Fisher's case, make clear you only do this when you've not looked at the data and you, and you don't have any prior information. And the name and Pearson de decision theory, and it was condemned by Fisher himself. This is a quote, I apologize for the gendered language, but he says, no scientific worker 
has a fixed level of uh, uh, significance that puts from year to year and in all circumstances he, he, he rejects hypothesis where he rather gives his mind to each particular case in the light of his evidence and his uh, uh, ideas. If you've already looked at the data and in climate science, we have always looked at the data. We have, uh, then you're prone to the multiple testing problem. This was already uh, recognized by Gilbert Walker, uh, famous for the Walker circulation. He was a mathematician actually, um, and he already had methods for correcting for, for multiple testing. There have been previous essays on the misuse of null hypothesis significance testing climate science by Neville Nichols and Martin Ambaum. This is 10 years later, more or less, I'll try again. Uh, I think it's only got worse since those papers were published, abetted by the ready access of online black boxes. And I think the obsessive emphasis on null hypothesis sig 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 significance testing by the so-called high impact journals in spite of their own editorials. Now, I, I, when I had to teach the, the, the stats course, or I knew I was going to, and I was curious about the, the statistics, I had a math and physics background, but you know, math and physics, uh, I think in most cases, it means analysis and algebra, not the math, it doesn't, it, and PDEs, it doesn't mean statistics at all, which is quite remarkable, really. So I read, went and um, did, I started, I went back and read some uh, sort of uh, fundamental kind of books. So one is uh, the, this book by Harold Jeffries, Theory of Probability. Jeffries was a Jewish f f physicist in Cambridge uh, who was working um, uh, up in Cambridge while all, all the frequentists were dominating things down the road at UCL. He was a geophysicist, as I said, he actually published some important papers in atmospheric th th dynamics in the 1920s, but in parallel with this, he, uh, he, he, he wrote this, um, that this textbook, which was the, um, really the only book, I guess, at the time, laying out this, um, the theory of probability and what you would call a Bayesian approach. Um, and then Jane's uh, very eclectic, uh, odd book. Jane's was a physicist, um, and he wrote his book, which was, uh, it was, it was published posthumously as a collection of lecture notes. So it's not, not exactly, it, it wasn't meant to be a book, I think, but his, his students published it and he dedicates it to Jeffries. I find J, uh, J, Jeffries e easier to read, although it's in a very old fashioned style, perhaps because of his, of his background as a geophysicist. And, I'll, and I have met many quotes from Jeffries uh, in my paper and I'll give a few here. But if you want something lighter, I, I, I recommend all of these books. Um, Lindley uh, was a very fa famous statistician in Britain. He, uh, he, he died a few years back. He wrote, of course, a lot of um, disciplinary um, uh, books and so on, but this is his popular book, which has almost no mathematics in it, which is quite remarkable, um, where he talks about uh, uncertainty. Nate Silver, uh, anyone in, in the States knows about him, I guess, the 538 website famous for predicting uh, elections and sports uh, uh, competitions. And he wrote a book about 10 years ago called The Signal and the Noise, talking about the prediction. He talks about everything from online poker to selecting baseball players for teams to weather forecasting to climate and so on. It's really, really nice book. And uh, finally, the, on the right, D D David Spiegelhalter, who's uh, a well-known st statistician in Britain, who's especially known for the public communication of science. He writes a column in The Guardian regularly about, about COVID. It's a very, very, yeah, Pelican, I think, is aimed at sort of the A-level a a or high school level. So it's a very, it's pedagogical, but it's a very um, um, uh, intuitive book. And I, I, I really liked it. Now, just to uh, step back, there's two ways of, well, there's two main ways of thinking about probability. There's different people have formulated this in different ways. One of the classic papers is by Cox from 46. You have the likely outcome from a chance process that leads to what's known as frequentist or sampling statistics. Then you have reasonable expectation and that leads to what you would call Bayesian or the, the belief statistics. Our hypotheses are beliefs, they aren't frequencies. Um, you can call that expert judgment if the concept of belief seems to have a religious connotation. Um, there's only one planet Earth, uh, but our statistical tools are mainly frequentist. So we have this, it introduces a mismatch between the physical and statistical concepts. Both Jeffries and Jane, Jane's point out that the frequentist methods were developed for situations with an abundance of data and little prior information. They were really developed in the uh, early part of the last century, and the main applications were agricultural trials and quality control in industry. 
In climate change science, we're in the opposite situation of an abundance of prior information and very little in the way of data, given the size of the phase space. And I'm, I'm, I'm considering climate models to be prior information as opposed to data. Um, so this in fact, we're in the opposite situation to one, the frequentist methods were essentially tuned for, says we should re reappraise the whole practice of statistics. So you go back to the fundamentals, principles of probability. I was actually really surprised when I learned that everything in statistics basically follows from these principles, which are really elementary. So it's quite something, um, you know, I had no, no idea it was this simple and you, you know, it seems you can't really argue with this. So it's a generalization of Aristotelian or Boolean logic to the case where the probability is between zero and one. If, if the probability is exactly zero, then it's something's false. If it's exactly one is true, but in general, a probability is, is between zero and one. You can visualize it in these Venn diagrams and you have the product rule uh, the probability of A and, uh, and B is, uh, is probability of A conditional on B times probability of B, or you can invert that in Bayes' theorem, very famous theorem that follows from that. The other is the sum rule, which is just that the probability of something and its complement um, must be one. Either it's, it's true or, 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 or its complement is true. And from these follow this, uh, uh, the probability of A or B is um, probably of A plus B minus the probability of A and B which you can see from the Venn diagram. And then you've got the principle of indifference, which is that if the hypotheses are mutually exclusive and exhaustive and none are favored over the others, then the probability of each of them is equal. And that's basically it. Um, and Laplace has this uh, uh, very famous quote. I give it in French, but it's in English. It's just the probability theory is nothing but common sense reduced to calculation. So that's the kind of spirit I would like, like to, that we should try, try to follow. Now, you, it's interesting, you can also define probability in terms of preferences, or if you like, proclivity to action. I just mentioned this as a side point because we're interested in often de decision-making. Um, goes back actually to Charles Peirce, who was a, a famous um, the pragmatist philosopher, American pragmatist philosopher in the 19th century who influenced Frank Ramsey, who was a brilliant mathematician in Cambridge in the 1920s, died at the age of 28, I believe, tragically, but not before he had revolution, had, had absolutely foundational uh, discoveries in pure mathematics and, and economics and philosophy, quite a remarkable character. And in this, um, he actually laid out the foundations of probability probably for the first time, but it wasn't published uh, before he, he, he died, but his notes got published afterwards. Um, Cheryl Mizak, who wrote, who's a philosopher who wrote this um, biography, which is a fascinating read, uh, talked about this, this um, influence of Pierce and has this phrase I like, Pierce argued that a belief is in part a habit which, which cashes out in, in behavior. And then the famous uh, statistician, J Jimmy Savage, uh, in this book from 1954, uh, uh, um, it developed, he called it the sure thing principle which is in red here, which is now the basis of, of, uh, of, of Pearl's causal uh, foundation, the sure, sure thing principle. If action A is pref preferred over action B when C is true and is also preferred when C is false, then it's preferred when C is uncertain. Seems, seems like, like seems, seems to make sense, right? So you can derive the same rules of probability from, the, from this direction. And of course, the relevance to the decision-making under uncertainty is obvious. So, this I, th I find very, very uh, uh, satisfactory that you can come at the problem from different directions and uh, you always wind up with the same axioms. Now, just in case you don't know, I'll step back about the null hypothesis si si significance testing. You, you, you define a null hypothesis, we call it H, that nothing special is happening. That, in other words, that the data has occurred by chance. If you have a precise de a definition of what you mean by chance, then you can compute a, a likelihood function, the probability of the data given, given the null hypothesis. And then the p-value is the likelihood that something at least as extreme as D could have happened under the null hypothesis. You either have a two-sided or a one-sided calculation depending on your alternative hypothesis. Um, and the null hypothesis significance test is if p is less than 0.05, then you're finding a statistically significant at the 5% level. You reject the null hypothesis and accept your own hypothesis. But this is wrong, as has been pointed out many, many times, and I'll, I'll explain why uh, here. Because to do that is to 
commit the error, what's called the error of the transposed co conditional. The probability of H given D is not equal to the probability of D given H in general. That's obvious from Bayes' theorem, uh, which I just write down here. So I've shown you Bayes' theorem earlier. And if you just have data and hypothesis, um, we're interested in the, uh, in the probability of a hypothesis. In, in the case of climate science, a, a, a hypothesis or a theory about uh, what's going on. Um, so we're interested in P of H given D, but the P value is measuring P of D given H. So there's two other terms in there, P of H and P of D. You shouldn't ignore those. P of H reflects the, the relevance of prior knowledge. This uh, captures the aphorism, strong claims require strong, strong evidence. Again, common sense. And what we find is that this formulation, common sense keeps coming into it mathematically, which is, I think, a good thing. P of D, that's something maybe a little, little more subtle. It requires consideration of all possible explanations for, for the data. So if not H is the, 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 the negation of, a, of H or complement, that's the, um, the sideways hockey stick there. Um, you could enumerate it over, over several explanations, but you can have di different, different alternatives, but let's just say we just have one. P of D is just the sum of P of D given H times P of H plus P of D given not H times P of not H. That's just the axioms of probability. But nowhere in any climate science publication, I'd be happy if someone can point this out, have I ever seen any explicit uh, consideration of these two P back, of these two factors which strongly affect the inference that can be obtained from a p-value. Um, I'm not talking about a Bayesian calculation. I'm just talking about someone invoking a p-value. And, um, and uh, there's a quote from Je Jeffries I like. He gets, says, we get no evidence for our hypothesis by merely working out its consequences and showing that they agree with some observations, because it may happen that a wide range of other hypotheses would agree with those observations equally well. To get evidence for it, we must also examine its various contradictories and show that they do not fit the observations. I think you'd all agree that's again common sense. It's actually the Sherlock Holmes principle. So uh, we, again we have um, common sense entering into the mathematical formulation here. So it's convenient to work with what's known as the odds form of Bayes theorem. So rather than the probability of h given d you take the odds which is p of h given d over p of not h given d. Sometimes you, 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 you can invert this, but let's do it this way. This is the odds of the null hypothesis. And then it's clear that the odds of, of on, on H uh, given D is equal to this, um, this, uh, uh, this ratio in orange in the middle, which is the, called the base factor times the, pri times the, the prior uh, odds, P of H. So in order to interpret a p-value, p of d given h, we need a well-defined alternative hypothesis, not h, whose likelihood function can also be calculated. The base factor is essentially just a ratio of p-values. P so you can't just go, go fishing with a vaguely specified alternative hypothesis. You have to be, be quite precise, precise. And you also need to consider the prior odds on the null hypothesis. Because if you don't do that, you're throwing out all your background information. So again, it's what I just said. You have to consider alternatives and you have to consider the, the, the priors. And if the prior odds are even, which is sometimes a kind of a neutral position, then the posterior odds just equal the Bayes factor, which is a convenient form of, um, form of this. But if the alternative hypothesis is only vaguely specified, then Bayesian statisticians have ways of modeling P of D given not H using uh, 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 uninformative priors. And those, those, um, those, the, the, those ways of modeling it penalize imprecise alternative hypotheses, which are prone to overfitting. So it's explained here by, by Garfield. If, 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 if the weather forecast is the high temperature will be, will be between 40 below zero and 200 above, Garfield's not very impressed by that. We should not be given much credit for explaining the data when our hypothesis for doing so is only vaguely specified. Effectively, it's another form of the multiple testing problem. So the p-value has to be downweighted by the fraction of the prior distribution for the alternative hypothesis that fits the data well. And there's a very nice article uh, by a particle physicist actually uh, that I think I've, I found very, very readable here. Um, according to the widely used parameterization of Selke um, uh, tw 20 years ago, a p-value of 0.05 corresponds to base factor of maybe only 0.04 or so, which is almost 10 times larger. So the, and the ratio of the two is called the Occam factor after William of Occam, uh, 
who's famous for Occam's razor that uh, you should keep things simple or as Einstein said, everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And again, the fact that such a well-established principle of logic is absent from frequentist statistics is already telling us the latter is an incomplete language for describing uncertainty, but again, it's built into the, it is part of the theory of probability. So here's, uh, there, there's an essay by uh, Nutso um, in 2014 that I think are, are, explains all this quite, quite ni nicely. So in this um, figure, uh, it, uh, it, it plots the, uh, well, let's look at the bottom actually, it's the outcome of different, of, it's the interpretation of different p-values and, and she compares p of 0.05 with p of 0.01 in uh, under three cases. So if you look at the lower right first, in this case, the p-value of 0.01 uh, corresponds to a 1% chance of no real effect, which is what we commonly think of it as. P-value of 0.05 is a 4% chance of no real effect, and 4% is almost 5%. But you're only entitled to, 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 to draw this conclusion if there was only a 10% chance of, uh, of no real effect in the first place. In other words, if the alternative hypothesis was, was already a good bet. So the usual- Could you use- could you use a pointer? Uh, oh, of okay. Course, sorry. Or, yeah. Can you see? Can you see my? Yeah. Okay. Now, now we see it. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, yes, I should do that. So, in this case, the the uh, alternative hypothesis, or or, or 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 the chance of a real effect, or it, it is a good bet. You got nine to one odds in favor. So, the usual interpretation of a p value is only valid for a good bet. If your if if it was already a toss up with fifty with fifty fifty. Um, probability, then your p-value of 0.05 still leaves you with 29% chance of no real effect. And if it was really a long shot, then uh, your p-value of 0.05 leaves you with an almost a 90% chance of no real effect. So this is the situation that explains the, the reproducibility crisis in data-driven fields. If you're just going fishing with a, with a wild hypothesis, um, you're, you're, you're the p and you're interpreting a p value as the likelihood of, of there being no, of there, of, of there being no, no real effect in making a huge error. Now, just to give an example, this is another very nice paper. I, I quote only nice papers. So, uh, uh, by Zambri et al. just came out last uh, fall. You, you, you may know that the development of the ozone hole over the last decades of the 20th century led to a delay in the late spring breakdown of the stratospheric polar vortex. So at the end of the, um, uh, uh, of the winter half of the year, uh, you have a vortex because of the low, low temperatures, then the stratosphere responds very quickly to sunlight and you get warm temperatures in the summer and easterly flow. So the vortex breaks down every springtime. And uh, because of the ozone hole, the, uh, the vortex got stronger uh, and persisted longer. And there was this delay in the late spring breakdown. And that's been uh, shown it's the main driver of, of observed trends in the southern hemisphere summertime with the mid, mid latitude jet. So it's been a widely studied phenomenon. And there's very high confidence, for example, in IPCC reports that after the ozone hole stopped worsening around 2000, when the, when the chlorine um, concentrations peaked in the stratosphere and have started slowly coming down, once the ozone hole stopped worsening, this delay in the, in the breakdown, which is attributed to the ozone hole, would, would not continue. Zambri showed that the changes in the observed trends before and after two, 2000 are, cons are consistent with what climate models predict. Very, as I say, very nice study, very comprehensive, beautifully done. But then they say that the trend differences are statistically significant, p less than 0.05. They say p less than 0.05 in the abstract. So again, what we ask, we can ask what this means. The null hypothesis was that the previous trends would, would continue. Now, I don't think there's a single person on the planet that would have argued that the previous trends in the vortex breakdown would have continued after the ozone hole stopped, stopped worsening. So the prior on the null is absolutely tiny, much less than one. The alternative hypothesis was only vaguely specified. Any trend other than, than a continuation was accepted as confirmation. So very loosely specified alternative hypothesis, therefore the base factor is much greater than the, 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 the p-value. So with an implausible null hypothesis and a vaguely specified alternative hypothesis, the evidentiary power of a small p-value is very small indeed. Now I think this is actually char characteristic of most studies in climate science. We aren't just going fishing, we are actually um, writing very much based on prior knowledge and physical reasoning, 
and the statistical test is really only only a, a sanity check. So just going back to the to this figure, I think most of the published studies in climate science are in the in this right hand uh, category, just that they don't acknowledge it. Now, so in, in my in my essay, I talk about uh, three uh, examples of um, uh, controversial uh, topics. One was the alleged global warming hi hi hiatus, where I think even very reputable climate scientists fell afoul of the multiple testing problem. Um, Ramsdorf et al. have a very nice analysis of this uh, a few years back. James Risby also ha has a paper where he digs into all this. Um, in case you were asleep somehow, um, or are younger, I guess, possibly. Uh, so the left panel shows the time series at the time of the AR5, which came out in 2013. And this is the, the uh, observed global average temperatures over 170 years. And you can see that at the very end, they had gone a bit flat. Um, and then there was analyses like, like uh, shown on the right in the, in, in the uh, technical uh, summary to, to, to look at how to um, uh, analyze this. But if you remove that from its context, no experts in statistical uh, analysis saw a pause. I like this paper from Lewandowski and colleagues. He, he's a psychologist at Bristol. Um, what psychologists do, uh, they take the data and they re re relabel it. So this is actually called world agricultural output. And then they took experts like MBAs and so on, um, asked them if, if they saw a pause. They actually took quotes from climate skeptics like the, um, the increase has stopped and has to judge whether they were disingenuous or accurate or, or, or whatever. They were asked to extrapolate the curve. They all said it would, it would keep increasing. Nobody saw a pause. I think the eye is a very good de detector of signal and noise. And also what I found a bit uh, odd, I, um, within the ARA 5 report, there was this figure in chapter 10. Um, which was uh, uh, looking at the uh, uh, um, uh, estimated contributions to global mean temperature change over, this is just 120 years, where these are statistical uh, um, fits based on um, um, greenhouse gases, so, uh, solar variability, volcanoes, and El Nino, and ENSO. And, and you can see it fits perfectly. So you already had within it, and I think it's been clearly shown there was this uh, La Nina event that led to a big, um, big, big spike. And then there was a very small contribution from declining solar forcing, but it was actually all there. Uh, and given that the prior anthropogenic global warming was extremely high, it should have taken a very small base factor to, to have raised any doubt at all. And uh, Je Jeffries has a quote, <clears throat> uh, very appropriate, the onus of proof is always on the advocate of the more complicated hypothesis. There's no point in rejecting the null hypothesis. In this case, the null is continuation of global warming until there is something to put in its place. Variation is random until the contrary is shown. It's instructive to compare the hiatus with the change in the stratospheric vortex breakdown dates that I talked that I talked about earlier. So the left is the crop of the previous figure of the hiatus. And they, this is the, um, the, the, the vortex breakdown date, which of course is an annual event. It's from a, a paper by a student of mine, but it's, it's the observed breakdown. And you can see that they look rather similar in some sense. The trends look rather similar, but they, our conclusions are completely opposite. And that's because we don't doubt global warming and we did not expect a continuation of the pre-2000 vortex breakdown trend. Just showing the data does not speak for itself. So why do you use statistical tools that assume this? Uh, second example is Arctic to mid-latitude connections. It's a very controversial topic. Um, many papers having quite uh, unconditional titles. I've given examples of four of them uh, down here. You know, mid-latitudes unaffected by sea ice loss. I mean, how can you even say that? Um, and uh, evidence of absence is not absence. Sorry, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's the inversion uh, uh, of the conditional. And the irony is, there's actually a lot of large funding programs on this very topic. So. Evidently, the funding agencies think that there's something worth investigating. So I wrote a perspective on this in uh, science five years ago or so, six years now, I guess, uh, which I think the points are still valid. The background knowledge is still is not is not very strong. Climate models have acknowledged the deficiencies. The observational record is short, and the causality is difficult to disentangle because mid-latitudes certainly affect the Arctic. So if you want to look for 
for an effect of the Arctic on mid-latitude, you have to somehow control for the primary effect. So effectively, the way I see it, the base factor is close, close to unity, which means that your posterior is, is the same as your prior, which means that believers can publish papers in favor uh, of the connection and skeptics, skeptics can publish papers against it. In this field, you can tell what the conclusion of the paper is gonna be by, by the author name, which is, I think, always a bad sign in science. So it's important to be explicit about the belief in case we, we, we mean a scientific hypothesis and with the co-authors at Reading, we, we, we published a paper in Weather and Climate Dynamics where we tried to do this. We had actually quite, a, quite some time getting it through the reviewers who didn't, didn't like this way of thinking. But there's a quote from Je Jeffries here that I think um, captures it. There are cases where there is no positive evidence for a new parameter. He would, the new parameter here would be the effect of Arctic sea ice on mid latitudes, but important consequences might follow if it was not zero. And we must remember that a base factor greater than one does not prove that the parameter is zero, but merely that it's more likely to be zero than not. Then it is worthwhile to examine the alternative hypothesis further and see what limits can be set to the new parameter and then to the consequences of introducing it. Very sensible guidance. Final example is extreme event attribution. Um, of course, the uh, attribution of changes in, in the statistics of weather and climate extremes has long been, been a, a subject of study. There was the special report on extremes from IPCC 20 years ago. More recently, there's been a question of the attribution of single extreme events. Now, it's far from obvious how to even pose the question within a climate science framework, and this is discussed in a National Academies report uh, in 2016 that I was, uh, that I was part of. Um, the most popular methodology from uh, Peter Stott uh, in two, 2004 was the first paper, and there have been many since then, takes a frequentist approach and frames the answer in a, what you would call a single definitive manner, going back to Ster Sterling's um, diagram. It re requires defining an event class because you have to create a, a population of events. Now, there's a number of issues with that approach, which I, I, I discussed in this paper in 2016 that you need to, um, your extreme needs to be rather weak because you have to get enough events to count them. The same extreme in a warming world will be very different meteorologically. If it's got the same temperature thresh, temperature, let's say, it, it might be extremely rare in the past, but becoming much more in the middle of the distribution in the future. And extreme impact is, sorry, is not uh, equivalent to extreme hazard. Um, but also, in most extreme events, the role of unusual dynamical conditions is generally a very important causal factor. But how those dynamical conditions could change represents a major source of uncertainty in climate information for uh, adaptation. This is a case um, from the uh, Australian wildfire season in, in the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, 2019, uh, late 2019. This is a, st a statistical analysis based on multiple linear regression. You could argue with it with some of the numbers maybe, but it, it uses an operational wildfire fire risk index. It's used by, by, by the firefighters. And they break down the, the increased risk that was seen that year into the, the trend component, which is the one in the, almost in the middle here, which actually is a very small. So the long-term warming was a pretty small factor. By far the biggest um, increase in risk came from drawing associated with unusual dynamical states, which they attribute to combination of the stratospheric vortex breakdown, which was, um, uh, 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 yeah, which was early that year, um, in Indian sea surface temperatures, Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures, and Pacific sea surface temperatures. And we don't know how those SST patterns are going to change in the future. Uh, an another example uh, with a colleague uh, in Brazil, Regina R R Rodriguez. Um, uh, in a paper that we've submitted, um, there was a failure of the South American monsoon in 2013-2014. Normally, there's the moisture flow comes off of the uh, off the Amazon in this in the South Atlantic convergence zone, but there was a blocking anti There was an anti cyclone which 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 um, which which blocked that flow and created a dry dry conditions. And then you had clear, clear skies as well and a heat wave. And uh, so you had, um, which was both in the marina and over land and le led to drying conditions. So it affected the whole food and water energy nexus, classic example of correlated risk connected with this uh, persistent anticyclonic circulation uh, anomaly. A probabilistic event attribution found insufficient evidence that climate change increased drought risk. So this is their 
their final figure. Um, this is a drug risk ratio uh, relative to pre-industrial. So one means no change. Uh, greater than one means that uh, climate change has increased the drought risk and less than one means it has decreased the drought risk. It's a log scale. And the observational record here, the GPCC uh, su suggests an increase in drought risk, but uh, uncertainties that span one. The CMIP-5 models for what they're worth uh, also suggest an increased drought risk, but the two um, variants of the Met Office model that they, that they ha had available and looked at um, had de decreasing drought risk. They then combined all these, all these uncertainties and said there was insufficient evidence to say that climate change in increased drought risk. But we can ask insufficient for whom? It's clear from their paper, they mean insufficient to project the null hypothesis. Uh, we've already talked about that. If you were uh, a water manager dealing with reservoirs or with hydroelectric systems or so on, I think you might uh, want to think about still the possibility of increased drought risk. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, now the uncertainty can be par par partitioned using, again, go back to the fundamental rules of probability. This is from the National Academy's report. Very, uh, you know that the pro joint probability, so if we just look at the top row here, the probability of, of the joint probability of E and C is a probability of E um, uh, conditional on C times the probability of C, that's the, the product rule. Um, and we can think of P1 as the future maybe and P0 as the present day. And then um, E is the event of interest like a heat wave or a drought and C is the circulation regime con conducive to that event. So in the, in the Brazilian case, the anticyclonic cir circulation. And you can see that the, that the ratio of the joint probability um, it, uh, factorizes to a product of this first ratio of conditional probabilities times the ratio of the, 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 risk, the, the, the risk ratio on the circulation anomaly. The first one of these is, represents the effect of climate change for a given circulation regime. Um, that really builds in what we know with, with confidence about climate change. So it's sometimes called the thermodynamic component of change. You can define it in various ways. It's not a precise definition, but it's very useful. The second ratio called the dynamic component, I've argued should be treated separately by, by storylines. It's not that we can't say anything about it, but we probably don't want to put a probability on it. So the uncertainty space is represented discreetly in a plural conditional manner, going back to Sterling's arguments. And importantly, it builds in self-consistency, which is essential for consideration of correlated risk. So um, IPCC seems to have uh, endorsed at least the, uh, the storyline approach in the AI AR6 work group one report. This is a figure from uh, chapter 10, there's a box in there. Um, and it, it talks about two different kinds of storylines. The first one is called an event storyline where you condition on a specific event and the regional warming pattern leads to the hazard and then yeah, combines with exposure and vulnerability to give the impact. Or you can step back a bit further up the chain and condition on global warming and re remote drivers and then that cascades through and leads to the impacts. Um, here's an example of an event storyline, Arctic ecosystem collapse. Um, this was a, a storm surge in the Mackenzie Delta in the Canadian Arctic in um, 1999. It led to irreversible changes from freshwater uh, with, uh, species, which are shown in green, to brackish species or saltwater, which are shown in red. And they have lake se sediments from the site DZO 29, which go back a, a, a thousand years and confirm that this was. Um, uh, 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 unprecedented in a, th in a thousand years. So that's a singular event best described through a storyline. And the storylines provide conditional explanations uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper that analyzed this, they, they, they discuss all these different factors, coastal retreat, tide, uh, and, and so on, storm surge. And the, uh, the only really essential factors were the long open season, longer open water season, which we know as a result of climate change and the Arctic storm. They claim the Arctic storm uh, uh, storminess is increasing big because of climate change. We we, we, we prefer to, to consider it a, a chance event because I think it's a somewhat contentious argument. But in this paper, there's no assessment of statistical si si significance or of likelihood. And the storyline approach aligns well with the for forensic approach to uh, attribution in the ecosystem literature with a philosopher of science, Lisa Lloyd, who has an ecosystem background a ecology background. Uh, we talked about this in this paper a couple of years ago and more recently with, with Lisa, um, it, it aligns well with li li liability under tort law. Um, 
So to conclude, scientific reasoning in climate science involves a combination of physically based logic and statistical calculations, since we can't do controlled experiments on the real system. So I finally, my final quote from Jeffries is this one, it is sometimes considered a paradox that the answer depends not only on the observations, but on the questions. He says it should be a platitude. In climate science publications, the physically based logic is generally stated in words and the statistics in terms of rituals, but they're not brought together in a systematic way and the statistical inferences tend to be treated as true false statements. And what's happened is that physical or causal reasoning has been divorced from st statistical practice. And if you read uh, J Judea Pearl's the, the, the Book of Why, he has a long history on, on how this happened, which is very uh, 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 interesting. Statistical practice should be embedded within structured logical reasoning, for example, in the form of causal networks. It is, isn't the only way, of course. Which, but that can avoid the errors of inference that can easily arise when the statistical analysis is treated as an end itself. Now, I may offend some people here. I'm not arguing for a full-blown Bayesian analysis, which I find can quickly become opaque. It certainly has its place in certain problems. You know, it's been, of course, used for climate sensitivity recently. It's been used for wet, wet West Antarctic ice sheet collapse and so on. I think there are problems where it certainly has its place, but um, I don't think we're going to convince everybody. And it's also hard to do. So I don't think we're going to, it's practical to tell everyone to become a full-blown Bayesian. But I am arguing for following some of the very basic logical principles of reasoning under uncertainty to be explicit about your uh, assumptions and consider alternative explanations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ted. That was an excellent, uh, excellent talk that, uh, I, that I could follow. And I'm, I'm definitely not uh, not an expert in this kind of area, but it's helped me understand a lot better why I'm confused by things. So I think that's a good okay. place for me to start. <laughs> um, so I can see that we have a question in the chat from uh, Christian Stroman. Do you want to unmute Christian or do you want me to read it out? 